Salam and welcome back to the TMV podcast. As always, I'm your host, Salim Qasim. Now, the last few episodes we've been talking about Palestine. Although this week's episode we're not going to be talking about Palestine, the issue is still as important as ever. In the last few weeks, over 21,000 people have been killed and I encourage people to please stay active online, use your voices, do as much as you can, do as much as you can to raise awareness about the issue of Palestine however you can. Um, so my guest this week is Muhammad Tahir. Salam, Muhammad. Alaikum salam wa I'm going to call you Moti if that's okay, because that's your, your Instagram handle and, and we obviously know each other personally. Um, so I guess as a, as a bit of a background, you're uh, an engineering system specialist at Heathrow Airport. That's right. You recently were awarded Young BME Professional of the Year 2023. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, and you're also a social media influencer and you make educational content about airports. That's right. Accurate? Yeah, pretty much. The whole yeah. aviation industry. And, and and you have more social media followers than Heathrow Airport. If you were to add up Instagram and TikTok, that's right, yeah. I, I, like, I like how you had a little caveat in there. In case anyone <laughs> wants to do the maths, okay. that's the maths you got to do. Just so it's accurate. <laughs> um, so... This has been a long time coming. Yes. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, the origin story of this conversation. But something that I've been thinking about a lot personally recently is mm-hmm. uh, my, my why mm-hmm. when it comes to doing things. So, you know, redoing the TMB podcast, yeah. I had to be very clear on why mm-hmm. I wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had, it's not just, oh, we yeah, had the opportunities there, we've got to take it. It's yeah. no, like, wh- why does this make sense? What am I trying to achieve? Yeah. Um, and with everything that you do, so obviously on the surface, it's you're an engineer, there's social media content that you make around airports, you do things like fantasy wings on the weekends where you talk to young people, inspire them, try and get them into engineering, you talk in community centers, uh, motivating people and inspiring young people. So the, 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 the first question I have is just why? So I guess the reason why I, I do what I do is if I was to rewind back in time to like when I was 16 and I look at like how I ended up do where I am, um, a large part of what drew me towards engineering in the first place was I used to watch a lot of like YouTube videos. Mm-hmm. So like the way I got into this was like I used to consume a lot of content from other people teaching about interesting stuff around the world. And I used to get sort of drawn into that, but that was never enough to make me go, this is what I want to do. The day that that flipped and made me go, actually, this is really what I want to do, it's what I love, mm. is the day I got like a one day experience at a company called Marshall Aerospace. My brother-in-law set up like a, a day where I got to go and get a tour, like an inside behind the scenes tour of this company called Marshall Aerospace. In that company, they have the facilities to design, build and fly an aircraft all from one spot. And just by being there and seeing what I saw, like the penny dropped, I was like, this is what I want to do. So when I joined the airport and I started working at Heathrow and I started to see all of this cool stuff, I had this like guilt that started to seep in, which I remembered like when I was 16, I wish I had seen what I'm seeing right now in the airport because it would have helped me like make my career choices so much easier. Mm. And I thought to myself, okay, well, if I can't bring all these young people into the airport, what I can do is I can bring the airport to the young people. And I'm very creative. I love making videos ever since I was a kid. I was that kid like that annoying kid on family holidays with the camera just filming everything right so i i kind of just combined my skills of like cameras like loving making content seeing interesting stuff learning about how things work and another thing i love doing is i love taking complicated things and simplifying them so i literally used to learn about the, all this complicated stuff in the airport and i just think okay wow like i, I want to share this like i felt like i loved learning about it and i yeah. thought maybe there's that 16 year old kid out there who if only they see what i'm seeing it would help them make that decision easier. And I guess that's kind of where it all started, that desire to learn something. And then after you've learned it, to pass it on. That's like a common theme throughout my life is learn and then teach. So uh, j- just to, to, you talked about your childhood there a little yeah. bit. Um, I remember, I think one of the first times we met, mm. one of the first times we spoke, mm. I remember asking you what football team you support. Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's relevant to the next question I'm going to ask you. So so which team do you support? I don't care about football, <laughs> like, at all, to be honest. You used to support it. I used to. I, I went through this phase of, like, pretending like I supported Man United, mm. and then I switched it to Arsenal. And then I realised, like, I actually don't really care about football much. But it took such... Basically, there's like, there's, you want to be accepted 
in the community. You want to be accepted by people. By your and peers, by, by your, your friends. Peers. Yeah, yeah, so growing up, like especially on the playground, I remember the first question I got asked when I stepped on the playground, like really young, was, yo, what team do you support? And I didn't have the guts to turn around at that moment and say, I don't care about football. Like yeah. you're instantly exiled from like any form of like network or like just peers or anything. So I just pretended like I was supporting Man United. But I slowly felt over the years like that was building up this like facade of like who I truly was. Like there was a version that I would show to the world yeah. and I'd like learn, or well, I'd literally go home and like research 11 players in case I ever get asked. So, so this was going to be my, my next question was that, like, I, I based on the picture that you've painted to me and, and as I said, we've, we've known each other for a while, we've spoken a lot. I imagine you as like a six year old yeah. in the garden whilst everyone's playing football and, and whatever, just like looking up at playing. <laughs> That's exactly is, me. Is, is, is that, yeah, like, yeah, how, yeah. how did that come about? At what point did you realize you were fascinated by playing? I was just curious, man. Like I, there was, there's one thing that I've always wanted to do is fly. Like I've always felt like this desire to want to fly. And when I'd look up at a plane and I just see it flying, I have this nagging, like question in the back of my mind of like how on earth is that thing taking off how on earth does that work mm. like why like why why is that possible how is that possible and that's what led me down this like curiosity of like wanting to learn about how planes fly um but i felt too ashamed to be open and vocal about that yeah, like that interest. Yeah, yeah, I just felt like I was gonna get classes as a nerd and just shut. And aside. I think also for, for most people, like I know, I remember there's one kid um, who I went when he was very young, mm -hmm. knew every single tube station <laughs> on the map. Yeah, like you, you could be like, okay, you get on at Arnest Grove, yeah. you travel five stations, where'd you end up? And he'll just give you the answer. <laughs> Damn, okay. Um, <laughs> like, uh, incredible, incredible. <laughs> or, or you tell him you want to go from Stanmore to wherever and he'll tell you the exact and, and he'll tell you the route city mapper like, L literally like <laughs> a human in. but i i find that like obviously those are ni nice like cute little skills as a kid but yeah. we often kind of outgrow these these phases and fascinations mm. and obsessions mm. um with things or like yeah. we dial it down that's Where, my question would you dial it down or do you outgrow them that's the question well y I, I guess you're probably not afforded the uh, the opportunity, like you're saying, to actually allow it to flourish. Yeah. So you go down a more traditional route of becoming a doctor, a dentist, or or yeah. whatever, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for you, do you think it was more a case of like your childhood fascination was allowed to be nurtured into a real career and and path forward for yourself? Hundred percent. And I'm I'm very lucky in that sense. Like I'm lucky to have ended up where I am. And there's there's like a, a fear that there's another kid out there who has that same desire, mm. who wants to go down the path that they're truly fascinated by, but life is telling them to go down this more traditional route. And the why of putting myself out there and sharing all this stuff yeah. is for that one kid who maybe can see what's possible and think, no, you know what, I'm gonna stick by this. Like, I wanna actually, I wanna actually do this. I'm gonna put my trajectory in the, the direction of the stuff that I'm interested in and not just get dragged down this more traditional route. Cause like I got, I got disheartened by it when I was younger. Like when I used to tell uncles and stuff like, hey, I really, I wanna be an aerospace engineer. Like I wanna be an engineer in the aviation industry. I remember one of my uncles pulled me aside and he's like, Muhammad, listen, you're a Muslim. Your name is Muhammad, you're Arab. 9-11's like just happened like mm. a couple of years ago. Forget about it. Like no one's gonna, and this is the thing exactly, Nobody is going to hire you in the aviation industry, point blank. And you just say it to me to my face. How old were you at that point? I'd say probably between like 14, 15 ish. Wow. And like, yeah, like in Arabic, it's like, had Marahant, like, short. Like, no one's going to hire you in the aviation industry. And I was like, damn. But it was like my brother in law who was like, no, if you're interested in it, like, just let me give you a day tour and see what happens. See what happens. And that was that insight into what's happening. I was like, yeah, there's no way I wanted so to do uh, after, anything else. So after that specific conversation, yeah. how how did you feel and how did you manage that? Because obviously we know what happens in the long run. You yeah. go on to become an engineer. <laughs> yeah. But like, what 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 was the process then? What was going through your head? Because I, I think, especially at that age, yeah. we adults know the world. Mm. We don't. We're kids, mm -hmm. right? We're just like naive people that are chasing our dreams and whatever. Yeah. And the adults like, no, they yeah. kind of beat that out of us yeah, um, yeah. with conversations like this. Yeah. So how, how did you feel and then how, what happened? I'm lucky that my direct family was actually very supportive. Mm. So although my uncles and the people around were trying to like back me off it, my dad's always told me, hey, do whatever you want to do. Like that's like, 
I'm not going to tell you to go do this. I'm not going to tell you to go do that. What do you find interesting? Go do what you want to do. And that was compounded by like my brother-in-law who had an insight into what was possible, yeah. who actually gave me a different perspective on that. Because had I had was if that was the only source of like adult wisdom that I had, if someone telling me, don't do it. Or if worse, if that was the person that was like directly responsible for me and was making those important choices for me and wouldn't allow me to go down that path, I wouldn't be where I was. So my family environment was very supportive to say, you'll do what you want. So, okay. I, I guess that's that's very, very helpful. So yeah. you were able to then just shrug aside a comment like that and, and, and plow forward. Shrug aside, probably a bit too easy to say. Like yeah. it, it definitely did have an impact, but I'd say like, the support network around allowed me to not make it like the front and center. Mm-hmm. Although it definitely was hard to hear and it was a hard pill to swallow, although it wasn't true, um, it wasn't the be all and end all. And I'm very lucky for that. Like to this day, I still get messages from young people who tell me, hey, my mom's telling me like, I can't, I- I'm not gonna get a job in the aviation industry. My name is Abdullah. Like I specifically remember a message from a kid called Abdullah who says, my mom told me they weren't going to hire a Muslim in the aviation industry, yeah. but I showed her your page. And like when I showed her your page, she was convinced. And it's like those moments where I like just goosebumps because I'm like, wow, like history is just like people are still out there believing this stuff. Believing the same narrative. And <clears throat> like your your journey, I guess, from from having very strong convictions. And as you said, like you like taking ideas and forming them into educating people and, and simplifying them, educating people. Yeah. Um, I think that goes very much hand in hand with your actual like day job career, mm. because you know on the one hand you're an a, a accomplished engineer working at Heathrow Airport, one of the largest and busiest airports in the world, but then alongside that is your kind of social media career. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think the the most cliche and 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 standard question people ask which i don't want to go down that route is of like oh how did you do it mm. like how, how did you grow your page and it's uh, the answers are always very similar consistency yeah. keep posting keep plugging away but i think what's more interesting for me is how you kind of um grew your 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 personal brand um and how you got the opportunities that you did and, and kind of kept escalating things yeah. and and i want to bring it back to again one of our first encounters we met at a careers day yeah. um, at, a, at a school. That's right, yeah. And I remember, like, I, 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 I don't think I'll ever forget, right? You spoke that day, and I think you brought that thing that's behind you. This the, thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this thing. So you, you brought that, and you spoke for, like, five or ten minutes. And, and like, legitimately, I was like, I should have been an engineer. <laughs> Because it it was so amazing, and then after the speech, so we all gave speeches. Mine was very bad, I'm sure. <laughs> then afterwards, we we went like to a different hall, and we all had a table, and like it was like you were giving out like I don't know like cookies or something because <laughs> everyone had gone to your table, and yeah. then I had like two of the teachers coming and sat, sat with me because they just felt bad because <laughs> no one had any questions yeah. about about the media and whatever else because because the. The presentation was that electric. And I was like, wow, this guy is like incredible. And I kind of like thought like who who gives him the right to be so articulate and inspiring? He's just like an engineer. Does that make sense? To be very real and honest. I don't think I've ever told you this. <laughs> um, so, no, you haven't ever told me. Yes. <laughs> you told me you wanted to be an engineer, but you no, 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 were no, offended. No, I was, I was like, this guy is ridiculous. Anyway, so I, I think shortly after that, and this is not why I said no at that point, but but I think shortly after that, because um, we, 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 we spoke a little bit, we exchanged yeah. numbers, and I think you sent a message to me or to the Muslim Vibe, I can't remember. Just the general Muslim Vibe page, yeah. Yeah, and, and you said it would be great to do a podcast, I want to inspire young people, blah, 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 whatever. At that point, you had, um, I remember it as 2,000, I think you remember it as 5,000. Something. In it, w- it, it was a relatively point. small yeah. uh, number of followers. Yeah. Basically, I got Ed is... <laughs> Is what I, you're about to say. No, I didn't. I, I didn't respond to the message. Yes, correct. But um, the reason why, and I think it's it's like a. I wanted to bring this up, not to like try and humiliate you, because obviously you know. But um, I think it's a it's an important point where a lot of the times people kind of start out on a journey, and they they. I don't want to say they feel entitled, but it's yeah. like obviously you wanna you wanna amplify your message, you wanna do as much as possible, yeah. and and do all of this. 
I didn't know you well at the time. Mm. What I wanted to say to you, or what, what, what I would have replied, so now the official reply, seven years later, okay, um, is that I think, you know, it's important to go on a journey. It's important to develop and grow. And I'm sure you've seen, and even in the few years that we've known each other, I've seen how you've developed as an individual, how your brand has developed um, to then, I guess, warrant the invite onto the TMP <laughs> podcast. No, but, uh, Mama made it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? Yeah, um, so so I, I think the, the question for me then, because... I remember you've you've previously told me that you know back in the day you used to message university societies mm -hmm. saying I want to I want to speak to the the, the university students. students I want to inspire them yeah and I'm sure you got aired by a lot of those as well or I don't know well I in those conversations I'd like see what I had at, like at my disposable to leverage yeah. disposal to leverage so I used to I used to like leverage the the fact that I used to work at a very well known airport and stuff like that so. It was always it's always in the pitch, right? So the way that I used to pitch it to the students, like, hey, like I'll come for free and just come and give a talk to try and inspire people. Mm. Um, and for me, though, the long vision of that, like the long lens of that, is when I I speak to engineering societies specifically, I used to know that as an engineer in an engineering like university, you never get ta taught some fundamental things that are important in the workplace, and those fundamental things are nothing to do with engineering, but they're actually the fact that no matter how good you are technically the thing that will stop you from succeeding in your career is actually your people skills, your ability to articulate yourself, yeah. your ability to communicate. And like knowing that, but knowing that nobody's telling them that was what I used, that was the message that I was like motivated to try and tell them. So it's mm -hmm. the same thing. It's like I learned something and I'm like, okay, I want to teach what I'm learning. Um, so when I used to message and I used to create these opportunities for myself, I used to leverage sort of, hey, I work at this airport, da, 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 da. you know, can I come and give a talk? Um, and then when I used to get there, I used to sort of deliver that talk. But like, I used to, I got reps, like loads and loads and loads of reps. Like, like I, I lose count of how many universities after work I used to go to, to give these talks and deliver these talks to, um, so that I can get become a better speaker. But also because I genuinely had a message that I wanted to share. But you're right, everyone feels entitled because everyone's message to them is the most important thing ever. Yeah. Um, but it, it's I, I guess that in itself is is a bit standout, right? Not many people will go ab above and beyond and like carve opportunities out for themselves. So I, again, it's easy to look at someone with you know, 100 plus thousand followers on social media. Um, sorry, I didn't add TikTok and everything <laughs> else. There. But you know, on Instagram, 142, yeah. I don't know what the number yeah. is. Um, and just be like, oh yeah, he's probably X, Y, Z, right? Mm. Um, but like I said, having having known you for a few years, I've I've seen the hard work that goes into it. Like the the weekends, like whenever I try to get a hold of you, you're on the car, you're in the car going to an event to give yeah. a talk or to attend an air show or this or that or in you know Vancouver at a conference. Like there's always last time you called me, I was literally like I'm in Vancouver. Yeah, <laughs> no, it was after that you were in New York. Yeah, so yeah, I called yeah. you in Vancouver. Then I called, and and I know I, I look at your social media and I know when you're all, uh, abroad, I'm like, okay, this guy's just sitting in his hotel room bored. Now I can actually get him on the phone. Yeah. So when you're in the UK, it's almost <laughs> impossible. Um, but what I wanted to ask is obviously you've you've mentioned one aspect of it, but how you from a from not having a sort of uh, close network of people that were in that industry mm. that were helping you drive forward, how did you essentially climb that ladder in every aspect? So I'm not just talking about the social media, I'm not just talking about your job, but in terms of like the networking and, and, and you know, carving out those opportunities, what was that process like? You know what's amazing is like, I feel like there is a science, but there isn't a science to it all at the same time. What I mean by like, there is a science to it that you, there's a mix between being proactive in traditional networking, where mm. you go to events to meet people. But I think one thing about putting yourself out there and genuinely doing the work is that the right people who need to speak to you and you need to speak to will actually seek you. So there are people in my life who they knew I was going to be at this event speaking. And after I come off stage, they'll pull me to the side and they'll be like, yo, I've been watching your stuff for a couple of months. We need to have a chat. Genuinely, like they're like, yo, we need to talk. Those same people would then a week later say, hey, there's this event happening in central London. You need to come along. 
So then before I know it, I'm in this event in central London and I'm meeting the next person. And then the next person I meet and we have a good chat. Turns out they're like somewhere senior and like a, 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 I don't know, let's say a Google or a, or a Facebook or a this or a that, like a massive company. And they say, oh, by the way, there's an event happening um, next week. Do you want to come along? Mm. And then that you get dragged along to that. And it's before you know it, your network just cascades. It's literally a domino effect. But you just never know which domino you're pushing mm. is gonna actually result in like the the opportunity or or the the big thing that like is gonna change your life. But I, I'm of the belief that <clears throat> like water your grass, like water the water what you have, work hard on like what you genuinely have, um, because it gives you like firm ground to stand on when you are networking, so that you aren't this this person trying to leech off other people. For me, I'm like, okay, how can I help? Like, what's the value that I can add to you? And then the value becomes like vice versa mm. um, and I think a, some, a lot of people when they think about networking they think take 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 but there's a service mentality that I like to but I think about even, even for me personally the term networking um, I, I, I don't like it so like I look at for example how we started the Muslim Vibe yeah. I met Haseeb at an event years ago back yeah. in like university days guy did, he didn't like me back then funnily <laughs> enough that's, that's a whole separate story but like we, 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 we stayed in touch we connected and then fast forward a few years um, we ended up, you know, starting a digital marketing agency and then the Muslim Vibe. Mm. And I think, you know, I would have never, you, you don't go into an event thinking, oh, I'm going to meet somebody and then I'm going to start this. Yeah, yeah. But it's only when you look back, it's always retrospective yeah. that you don't realize that actually meeting this person changed your life because mm-hmm. they then introduced you to this person. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, sometimes you, you, you don't even do the maths. No. You don't realize until afterwards. Connect the dots. Connect the dots. It's like, oh, actually, that was because of him or yes. that's because I went there. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's, it's it, I guess it's mind blowing, right? One thing I always have front and center of my mind whenever I go into an, like, some, like, whenever I'm going to an event where there's potential that I might meet somebody, mm. I always pray. I'm like, Ya Allah, you know who I need to meet. I can make a list of attendees and go and try and target people, but Allah, you know who I need to meet. So just make it happen. Like, that's genuinely, like, that's full, like, fully, fully, fully. That's just what I think. I think, okay, Allah, I don't know who's best for me. I don't know who's going to take me closer to you and allow me to, like, do more good work in this world. Yeah. But you know who. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm just going to be ha- smiley and, and, like, you know, try and add as much value to that event as possible. But I don't know who's good for me. So whoever is good for me, make it happen. And that served me personally, like, big time. I, I think you can you can also give us a story there. So yeah. the um, the flight that you were recently on to New York. Yes. You met a bunch of interesting people, yeah. including Richard Branson. Including but we Richard. can, I think, park that to one side for a second. Yeah. But uh, I remember when, when we had that conversation, you were in New York, like, yeah. I, like we mentioned earlier. Yeah. And... And it was it was mad because again I'm I'm a lot more the kind of person where I'd be like looking at people's faces, trying to figure out who they are, look up their LinkedIn, and then be like, okay, I need to like bump into that person. Or I need to, but you just like so 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 what happened on that okay. flight? For context of that, who what that flight was? Yes. in case anyone Go doesn't for know, it. right? So um, the, for the first time ever, um, there was a flight going from London to New York using 100% sustainable aviation fuels, like a commercial airliner commercial jet was flying across the Atlantic Ocean using 100% sustainable fuels. That's like fuels made out of like the stuff that comes out of a fish and chip fryer from like the local fish and chip shop. Anyway, this is like a huge milestone, like a sustainability milestone um, in the industry. And on board that flight, every single person who was on board that flight, it wasn't like a ticket you can just buy offline. Everybody was handpicked to be on that flight. So the people on that flight were Richard Branson, Richard Branson's team at Virgin, like global team, the CEO. Basically every like big hitter in the aviation industry was on board this one flight going from London to New York, the CEO of Heathrow Airport. So like my boss's 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 <laughs> at the time was on that flight. All of these huge, huge individuals, people from the government as well. Everyone, basically this flight was like networking on steroids, seven hours of like yeah. the creme de la creme of the industry that I love was on this flight. And as I was walking through the aisles, I just see this guy 
sat down and I was like to him, hey, what's your name? And he was like, oh, my name's Peter. I'm like, oh, okay, Peter, like, you know, it, to, to, to words of the extent of like, oh, what brings you on the flight kind of like, you know. <laughs> what brings you here today? Yeah, what brings you here today, basically. And he was like, oh, you know, like I've, I've known Richard for, for many years. And he points at Branson, he's like, I've known him for many years. Um, and, you know. Oh, you're like, yeah, me him. too. No, <laughs> that's just lying through my teeth. <laughs> anyway, we start chit chatting, and and they bring out like they bring, they give me like a you know like a, a dessert, and I sit down with him next to him, and we're just having desserts. I'm having a chit chat. Um, he tells me a little bit about what he does, but he's relatively like high level and vague. And I, he tells me, "What do you do?" And I'm like, "Well, a bit complicated." And I explain to him what I do, and I give him my card that says the airport guy on it. Um, and he's like, "Yeah, you know what? You need to, you know what you should think about. You should think about like this. There's this opportunity here." Actually, you know, strategically, this would really help you. This is an opportunity that you might be want to keep an eye out for. And he starts to give me like a whole breakdown of like what I can do from like a business perspective and like how I can build and how I can grow. And I'm just there going, damn, like I start taking notes. And I'm like, well, Pia, man, this is like really helpful. Like, I appreciate you being so open. Anyway, have like a 20 minute chit chat. I go back to my seat and the person next to me is like, do you know who that was? I'm like, no. Peter? I'm like, yeah, it's Peter. And he goes, so... Richard Branson owns Virgin. This guy's the chairman of Virgin globally. He's Richard Branson's like wow. right, the guy who basically run all the CEOs will report up to this guy. And I was like, it's just Peter. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> just, in my head, he was just Peter. And like I, I, one thing that I learned from that, and it's something that I try to keep close, like throughout, like all this networking, quote unquote, is fundamentally people are people. No matter their job title, no matter they're this or they're that, it's just a human being. And all of us human beings, you know, we go to sleep at night and it's the same thing. So as long as you can have a conversation with somebody and it's a pleasant conversation and they hopefully remember you well, Mm. that's kind of the aim of each conversation I have. I'm not walking into that conversation saying, oh, you know, here's my research that I've done about this person. Here's what they could do for me. Go in there, have a chat, put a smile on your face, be curious about them and and what they do and stuff like that. And I I did speak, I was asking him questions like, what was it like, like back in the 70s? Like, what was your dream when you were younger? You know, and I was like asking, he was like, well, back in my day, inflation was at 25% when I was trying to buy a house and, you know, like the bins weren't getting collected. And he was telling me all these like things that were happening. And he was like opening up for my end. I was opening up for my end. But it was just two people having a chat. And for me, I like networking to just remain that. Mm. And then whatever comes after that. Whatever comes, comes, comes. Yeah, 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 I get that. And <clears throat> in terms of uh, like being on the journey, I think you you would probably say you're still on a, a journey, right? It's 100%. not like you're the the, the finished product. No, or, no, I don't no. think you would ever think that you are. Um, it's only the beginning, man. Genuinely. But how how do you how do you look at kind of your uh, refining y- your your skills hmm. um, and and like even your your videography, whatever it might be? Uh, like, what's that journey like? How how do you um, look to improve and, and, and develop as time goes on. Reps, personally. Like, I just try and reps get as, as many in repetitions of that thing okay. until I get better at it. I'm the type of person who learns more by doing, not by, like, looking at the theory or trying to understand, like, the theory. I mean, the theory is important, and I think yeah. there's a lot of value that can be gained from theory, and hence why I bought the books that I bought with me, because I think there's some insight that you can gain from theory, but... No, no insight can be just going out there and doing it. Yeah. Like if, let's say speaking, well, by the time you had seen me speak at, at that careers fair, I had probably within that past six months delivered like 30 talks about engineering. So like when I stood up there and I knew I had five minutes to like try and inspire people to join engineering, at that point I was thinking, okay, what's the story I'm telling? How am I going to be able to make it engaging? How am I make it captivating? Mm-hmm. But then also just like really leaning into like the moment, like trying to get the most out of the moment. But you've also got the experience bank at that point to say, oh, when I said this at this place, that worked. That Bingo. connected with this Bingo. audience. And that's reps. Yeah. So like reps and constantly like um, reflecting on the reps. Yeah. I, genuinely, I, don't, I think it's if you try and turn it into a science, you can. But that's not really my style, man. I'm here to enjoy the moment and like. I don't necessarily want to get there fast, mm. like in terms of the journey and like in terms of what I what what career I want to create for myself. I genuinely don't want to get there quickly because every time I've read about anybody who got to the destination they had, they actually had more fun getting there yeah, than yeah. they did when they ticked the box. So I'm just trying to enjoy the journey and like live it and like really embrace it and like these opportunities that come out, man. Just embrace them as they come along and just have a good time. Um, all right, now. 
<laughs> I want to talk about uh, from like a bit more of a religious or spiritual angle. Mm. Um, as your page has grown, um, I think you've had periods of time where you've tried to incorporate faith into yeah. the content that you produce. Yeah. Um, at other times, not so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what has that been like? And in terms of being authentic, and this is something that I think it's very easy to to judge people, mm. um, and it's definitely something I do. I think everyone does to an extent, especially when someone puts themselves out there on social media. You can be like, oh, he's just showing us X, Y, Z from his life, or yeah. he's making it all look so easy and so fun. And even I feel personally that when people are trying to say how hard it is, yeah. that's also like a, a, a front of some really? sort. I'm very cynical, by the way. I know you are. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so like, I'll give you an example. I remember um, once upon a time, so I've deleted my Twitter account now. I'm not on Twitter anymore. Once upon a time when I was active on Twitter, um, I used to tweet about all sorts, whatever. And then one time I pulled out my phone, I was like, oh, I need to fire off a tweet. But then I'm like, okay, what do I want to tweet about? And then I was like, <laughs> like an alarm go off. That says, no, no, but, 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 sure tweet. but, but I, then I'm like, okay, there's, there's nothing that I want to say mm. personally. Mm. And, and again, you know, my, my personal perspective on social media, yeah. there's nothing that I personally want to or need to say on this platform to these people. Yeah. Right. So it's <clears> like, <throat> I think every engagement with social media is contrived to an extent, whether people know it or not. Right, either you're like uh, a zombie that's sleepwalking through the phases of uploading a selfie, taking a picture of your food and uploading it and tagging and all of that stuff, or you're actively trying to curate um, an image of yourself to the world. Why it's so binary? Why this or that? It's my podcast, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can challenge that. No, but you, you know what I mean. Like, I, I isn't. Of course, there is. Uh, there is a lot of nuance in grey. Why are you yeah. doing this? It was a um, nice. It was a nice like well, thing it, I had. It going was an oversimplification of something but very complex. I, yes, you're right to an extent, but I I do think that um, if we take it like now we have to strip it back because yeah. you've, you've you've opened this can of worms. Right? <laughs> As human beings, yeah. we have to eat. Yeah, we have to sleep. Yeah. We have core bodily functions that yeah, we have to do, yeah. right? The clothes that we wear mm -hmm. signal something to the world about who we are. We wear things for a particular reason, comfort, fashion, uh, affordability, whatever it might be, right? But there are, there are conscious or subconscious decisions being made by ourselves on everything, like yeah. why you decided to wear what you wore today, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. right? So my point is, do you <coughs> agree with that principle? Sure. Okay, so my point is now, if we extend that to social media, yeah. firstly, having a social media account, mm. there is something there. Why yeah. do, you want, do you want to be connected to people? All right, yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Then it's like, are you going to be someone who just receives content on social media or actively posting content Cre out? Yeah. If you're creating content, what kind of content are you creating? What is it about? What value is it adding? Does it, uh, is it egocentric or is there something else behind it? Mm. Like, are you trying to educate people about something, bring people closer to God, whatever it might be? Um, and, and then also, I, I think at the same time, and we'll, we'll talk about ego and, and all of that stuff in a bit, but there's, there's always that going on mm. in my head in the yeah. background. So for me personally, it got to a point where I, would, I, I couldn't tweet anymore because mm. I'd be like, I, I don't need to say anything right now. I don't feel like compelled to have to spew my thoughts to people Whereas, yeah. and, and bear in mind this is I've been, I've been on a journey yeah back in the day i used to be very free-flowing with my <laughs> thoughts on social media um but you know people change and times change and whatever um and obviously i don't for a second begrudge people who are active on social media i mean we've built the muslim vibe as a platform to exist on social media because i fundamentally know that it's a platform that people are on yeah and therefore you have to be able to produce content on their terms, where so to are. speak, yeah. where they are, so that they can learn, benefit, yeah. whatever. Yeah. I don't even know what my question was at this <laughs> point. Um, no, what I was, what I was going to ask you, I, I guess, is about about yourself being authentic yeah. and finding a voice that was comfortable for you, mm. um, and and also being real. Like, yeah. you know, do you want to show how tired you are when you feel deflated, or is it all about positivity? And especially, I think, with a brand like yours, like your 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 Instagram handle is motivate. Yeah. Um, you can't be like sat on the sofa eating pizza every night and posting that and be like, stay motivated, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, very interesting. So is it still binary? Uh, Did I, still I, make I understand. It? Do you understand I, the nuance? I understand where you're coming from. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So 
let me let me I guess walk through like my journey of like social media and like where it started off from. Mm. Right, I started my page back in um, June 2018 as Motivate, where I literally used to upload personal development stuff. Why? Because at the time I was learning so much about personal development. I was reading so many books, like way more than I am right now. But I was learning so much. I just had this urge to share. Like I genuinely wanted to teach what it was that I'm learning. And I remember I was sat up in a tree on a golf course, literally where we live, right? And I was like, and I was on this tree and I was like, I made a video about how like your thoughts become your words and your words become your actions and your habits and all of that sort of stuff. I remember like, I was just genuinely coming out of my heart. I really took it like 54 times. <laughs> <laughs> from, from the heart, from 54 the heart. times. <laughs> 54 times. Anyway, I uploaded this and like it went nowhere. It was just it was just my face on a on a motivated. That's not how these stories are meant to go. You meant to go. It went viral. Yeah, but it did it. Yeah. But that was where it started. Like I just wanted to share mm. what I had going on. Um, anyway, fast forward to October, and then Haurat Milani, one of like my family friends, she was like, "Hey, like, Haurat's been on the podcast, Haurat's by been, the way." Okay, fair yeah. enough. Go check out Haurat. <laughs> Maybe a pop up will appear here. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll put it up somewhere here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I was like, she was like to me, I was telling her about my job. And like for the, for me, I love working at the airport. Yeah, I was yeah. telling her about all this stuff. And she's like, why don't you share this stuff? Like, why don't you share this stuff online? And I was like, oh, okay, I guess maybe. And then I was, I went back to this page, Motivate, and I just deleted everything that I had uploaded. I uploaded like four things, deleted everything. Long scroll, but there's only four posts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. There was no scroll, <laughs> just four <laughs> things. Deleted them all. Yeah. And I took a picture of myself. And I decided that, you know what? I want to get better at writing. I want to get better at writing and I want to express through writing. And I said, this is my page and I'm just going to talk about my journey and like what I think, what I feel. At the time, I never used to have any time to like write. I never used to actually write anything. Like, you know how it is like life. So, and I, and I was trying to like invest. I was learning about investing in finances. So what I did is I was like, okay, how can I create time in my day, but also save money? And I realized that if I sell my car, that I'm able to create time in the day and save money at the same time. So I deleted my car and I used to take the train to work. And why that, the reason why it's important is that I used to create 45 minutes of time where I sit there and just type. Mm. And I used to type whatever was in my heart, like whatever I'm learning about, whatever I'm feeling, whatever, however I'm feeling. I used to write these long captions with like a picture of the airport, but like the content was this. And people used to read that. I used to get messages of people who used to read that. I'm surprised. I'm like, why is anyone? I'm dyslexic. Like, I don't even, don't even know I could write. But people used to read this. But it got to a critical phase where the day, one day I pick up my phone and the thing that I want to write about was God. Like, I just, I was, I felt spiritual in that moment. And like, I didn't want to talk about anything else. I want to talk about God. But up until that point, I had never mentioned Allah. I'd never mentioned God. So it felt like I was about to cross this line of like speaking about God publicly. Mm. And if for some reason, it just felt unnatural, weirdly, like to speak as a Muslim, to speak about God openly on, on social media. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Like it just didn't feel, there was this resistance to, to openly speaking about Allah in public. Like I had mentioned it here or there, but I'd never like made a post talking mm. about God. And I remember there was like a hesitance, like a very slight moment of hesitance. <clears throat> the only thing that got me over that hesitance was the next subhanAllah, the next time I uploaded open social media, after I had that moment and I shut it down, the next time I open it up, I see a post from one of my Christian friends called Milimo on his story talking about how much he loves Jesus. I thought, why am I sat here holding back from talking about God as a Muslim? Mm. Meanwhile, my Christian friend so openly talking about how much he loves Jesus. Like, what kind of what kind of like relationship do I have with God where I feel like I can't speak about him so openly and like so proudly? And that flipped a switch in me, and I was like, no, I'm I'm gonna speak about it. Like this is, like, w I kind of felt like as a Muslim when you speak about God, you kind of get shoved into like this extreme category. But I wanted to show the case that that wasn't the case. You can yeah. still be a, a normal part of humanity and like part of the community and still be very God centric in your thinking but not just get canceled. So that was a huge critical moment for me. And actually I started to like embed 
God, if ever I want to talk about God, I'll talk about God. Huh? When I when I went to like a, a visit to Syria, I was taking pictures of mosques and like Islamic architecture. And like I started to really embrace that sort of side of me and embed it into my content. I wouldn't allow that to be the separate thing that I keep at home mm. or the separate thing that I keep somewhere else at the mosque. No, like my content is just a reflection of who I am. So I'd be doing the content and injustice if I genuinely wanted to reflect who I was by avoiding God. And actually, subhanAllah, that's when I started getting messages from like young Muslims saying, Bro, like seeing you be so open about God on your social media helps me be more confident in my faith in public. And I just think like crazy because like I was that and I had to like gain sort of a gain confidence from somebody from a different faith yeah. so that I can have confidence <coughs> in my own faith. But alhamdulillah, like maybe I can pass that on to the next person to be confident in their own faith. So there was a critical moment of like, do I speak about God on here or not? Like, it, just, it feels like I'm building this thing. Do I, will I get cancelled? Will I not? All of these thoughts start running through your mind. But alhamdulillah, like, you know, God sent me a, a sign, it felt. And I just decided to go with it. And yeah, why now? And in terms of, um, so I, I think a, a big thing about w- what you like talking about and doing is is personal development related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and... Uh, I, I guess like uh, uh, a central thesis that you have mm. is that Islam is personal, personal development centric. Yeah. Can absolutely. you can you expand on that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. So and, and how you also came to that conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, there's there's like two examples of like how I came to that conclusion that really make it make sense to me. Um, I got to a period of my life when I really got into personal development. It was extremely secular. Like the stuff that I was learning about was nothing to do with faith. It was yeah. actually very Buddhisty, like universe type, like personal development, like unlocking your chakras and and stuff like that. Like it was very, um, it was very. It, it felt like not religious, yeah. but very spiritual. Um, and I remember I was reading a book called The Yusa Guide to Balance, and it was describing meditation and what meditation is. There's another book called. Uh, the power of now again which describes meditation very secular way it, it touches upon god maybe here or there but it's not the central theme of it but it talks about okay if you wanted to get better as a human being what controls you what's what's the part of your body that is in control your brain your brain if you can't control your brain your brain just goes into autopilot and it basically controls you mm-hmm. you basically become like a, a puppet of whatever your brain decides for you so there's a there's a moment a critical thing in life where you have to be able to step outside of your brain observe your brain and call the shots as to what your brain does and the way in which you get to that point according to these secular books was meditation meditation is where you take five minutes out of your day and observe your thoughts rather than live in your thoughts observe your thoughts step out of them and watch them as they appear and just by doing that you instantly be able to regain control you can choose yeah i want this one and i don't want this one not every thought that's going to come into your mind is going to be something that's going to be constructive in your life so actually be an ability to step back and observe that means that you can decipher what goes on in your brain which means that if you can control what your thoughts are you'll be able to control what you say if you control what you say you control what you do you control what you do your habits are controlled then your character bits comes controlled and your destiny is controlled in that order. Your thoughts, your your thoughts, your words, your habits, your actions, yada, yada, yada. So how do you do that? You take five minutes out of your day, you step back and you think about one constant thing. In meditation, they say your one thing, as long as you're alive, you're going to be breathing. The one constant in your life is your breath. So for five minutes, just think about the one constant thing in your life, which is your breath. And by doing that, you're able to remove yourself from your thoughts and you're able to control them. And I thought to myself, the one constant in my life is my breath. What about when I die? When I die, that constant goes. What's more constant than my breath? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more constant than my own breath. Hold on a minute. Take five minutes out of your day. Think about one constant thing and you'll be able to control your mind. And when you control your mind, you control your life. Five minutes out of your day, think about one constant thing. Five minutes out of your day, think about one constant thing. When it when it hit, like when it clicked, I was like, that's salah. Like salah is literally God telling you, take five minutes out of your day, five times a day, and just think about one constant thing, and that thing is me. Think about Allah, and you'll be able to regain control of your mind. You'll be able to control your life. And I was like, why has nobody told me that salah is like that? Like why did nobody teach me that actually Salah is benefiting you in the fact that your own like neuroscience, your psychology, 
will benefit from taking those five minutes out. And when that when that realization hit, I was like, well, hold on. If, if salah is like the daily prescription to do that, what else is there that's like it's fundamentally in Islam? But if I was to look at it from a lens of personal development, it adds up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fasting. I, I was just about to say fasting, right? They have the the fasting two days a week. Um, I can't remember. I think it's a, J- a Japanese guy that's come up with this whole thing. Yeah. And and it, it's it's become such a big thing now in, in these circles. And, and like we've had this for years. And I think the interesting thing, sorry to cut you off, I wouldn't no, come back. Cool. But the interesting thing for me about where we're at right now in history is that when I was growing up, when I was 16, 17, we didn't have social media, we didn't have reels, we didn't have Instagram, we didn't have YouTube shorts, mm. where you just get these like massive doses of, of inspiration where things can connect in a second. Yeah. So even I was telling a friend about this the other day where like, you know, parenting tips, for example, where, uh, unless you were reading parenting books back in the day or speaking to people, you weren't learning anything. Mm. Whereas I've learned so much about helping to emotionally regulate my children at bedtime and what they really mean when they're asking X, Y, Z. Um, and then you can implement that. And, yeah. and there's so much development that I think I've had as a result of uh, having social media. Mm. And we're only seeing that today, whereas... Back in the day, there wasn't all of this to be able yeah. to connect these dots. Yeah. It was like, you know, just grainy pages on the internet yeah. on like untrusted websites, like a random <laughs> blog that you don't know if it's authentic or not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's I, I think we're at a time when it's a lot easier to connect those dots than it ever, than it ever was. I Do you know what I mean? Also, because we're so, we have so much more interaction with people who have different perspectives on life. Mm. Like the reason why I started reading a Buddhist book was because I played American football at university and I met this atheist guy who was like basically just like all about the universe and about the chakras and he recommended me read this book. Like had I not crossed, like if you, if you were to rewind, you know, 500 years, I would have just been a guy in Baghdad. Like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I, wouldn't know, I wouldn't have crossed paths with that guy. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't have been able to read that book. But like we live in a social society where the dots are there but we kind of need to like do the work to connect them. And we have social media that allows us to have access to so much more information, but we kind of need to do the work. The, 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 these things happen in the moments of like silence when you're able to connect the dots. Mm. That's, that's where like fireworks go off in my brain, bro. Those moments where I'm learning something new are, are the moments where I feel most alive. And when I feel most alive, that's when I feel most inspired to want to teach. And I want to go and I want to speak about this. I want to learn. I want to learn and I want to teach. Um, so when I was learning about Islam and about how it's so intrinsic to personal development or vice versa, personal development is so intrinsic to Islam, I just wanted to teach these things. And I used to like go to mosques and mosques. I used to go to the mosque. I said, hey, I'll, I'll give a talk. And then when I used to give the talk, I used to just start off talk completely unrelated to Islam. Talk about the brain and how to have brain control. Right. And like teach kids how like oh, if you had a controller, how would you, you if you had to play FIFA, and I had to teach you, you have to know the buttons on the controller so that you can play FIFA, otherwise you're going to just slide tackle <laughs> way off. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We don't have the ball. Slowly, 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 allow them to say, okay, well, I need to understand how my brain works. How does my brain work? This is how your brain works. Your thoughts are like this, like this. Okay, so if you wanted to get mind control, how do we do that? Meditation says this, and then da 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 connect the dots. Oh, wait, constant Allah, Salah. So Salah is about brain control. Yeah. And then when you teach a kid that, they just go, oh my God, like Salah is about mind control. And you just see that explosion happen in their brain and you go, yeah, man. <laughs> like, you know, and I wish somebody had taught me that. Again, it always comes back to like, I wish somebody had taught me this stuff. Um, same with like fasting, detox of the body, discipline. Like if I tell you, Salim, don't eat for the next 24 hours. Right, the cravings are always there. How many times have we just stood there on the fridge and we're like, I really shouldn't eat this, but mm. you just grab it anyway. How come the moment <clears throat> Ramadan, the first tick ticks around, you can open up the fridge, but you'll just not eat it? Yeah. Like all of a sudden, you flick the switch and that is enough. I remember even at, even at school, like I, I would sit in the lunch hall with my friends and they'd be like, Oh, this must be so difficult. I'm eating. I'm like, No, it's fine. It's, why? It's not difficult. But why is that? Yeah. It's because like Allah subhanahu wa taala is teaching us. Like by the way. You have the ability to just flick a switch and stop doing and things. Stop, yeah. But we don't even believe that in ourselves. When you go to work, I mean, for you, work's a bit different. But like when I go to work and I'm like, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm fasting, and they go, what? Not even water, <laughs> like you know, standard. But for us, yeah, not even water. 
for them it's like oh, that's impossible mm. but Allah is teaching us that whatever you believe is impossible truly is actually possible like when you start to look at every single element of Islam and you try and draw a dotted line towards personal development it will be more than a dotted line it will be a solid line and yeah. you'll realize your soul your body your mind everything improves by these practices that we've had for thousands of years but getting that logical understanding of it it just yeah it, it, it really allows me to like see the world in a different way in terms of so I, I, I want to move the conversation on a little bit Go on. Um, I, I think you know what's coming here so, uh, <laughs> Uh oh. <laughs> I wanted to talk about um, so firstly, I, I guess the ego side of things. Yes. Um, and and managing that. And I guess yeah. I'll I'll start by being open a little bit, Go right? On. So, um, I, I've been doing stuff with the Muslim vibe for a while now. So mm-hmm. like, generally or sometimes, well not generally. That's a massive overstatement. <laughs> occasionally, it does happen. <laughs> I know what's coming. It happens a lot. More o- occasionally, someone <laughs> like, oh, you're the guy from the Muslim vibe, whatever. He goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I try and tell myself, you know, whatever. Um, but then, like, what, what's been happening recently is that, um, you know, we've we've done some so forest fitness that we mm. go to on a, on a Sunday and you record videos and you have an infinitely larger social media following than I do. So a couple of times in, in recent months, people have been like, oh, I know you. And I'm like, here we go. TMV, let's go. <laughs> and they're like. You're you're the guy in, in running in the back of Moti's um, uh, Instagram stories. So I'm I'm basically like your I've become your backup dancer, um, and 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 obviously like that's <laughs> it's, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I don't even know where to where to where to go from here. But but yeah, no. My my point is from from like an ego perspective. Um, naturally, with putting content out there, with being on social media. Yeah. Th- there comes a lot of that yeah. and like I remember I've asked you in the past like you know how often do you get recognized at Heathrow Airport and it's pretty often right I, dro- I just came from there today uh, the guy who oh, was, the only uh, person by the way that would go to their job on their day off I was dropping off family doesn't matter but the guy who was there you know <laughs> he recognized you yeah so so this is what I mean right and like like obviously you're not doing it for that I know that no. and it's like you know if I if I if I spent as much time on TMV and, and, and building this up for the ego massage, it's, it's a pretty like wasted venture, if you know what yeah. I mean, because it's very short lived. Yeah. Um, but how, how do you manage that ego? Um, and I don't know if you want to jump straight into the, 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 the viral clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's, should, we, we, can, should we go there straight away? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can work our way there and go there straight away. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention it for context sure. and then you can kind of just talk about your journey yeah. with managing ego. Yeah. So I'm, it's ironic that I'm holding the bottle for this segment. Um, <laughs> so uh, earlier this year, I believe, no, I, I, 2023, we're now in 24. Mm-hmm. Um, so middle of 2023, mm-hmm. um, you had done another podcast. It's brave right. of you to do another podcast after that. Um, oh, the reps, bro. Reps. <laughs> reps. I wasn't lying. So on 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 that podcast episode, uh, there were two clips that were cut up by the podcast producers themselves yes. and put on social media. Correct. And uh, if you ask me personally, I don't think they were the best selection of clips, or maybe they cut them too short. It didn't look good. It mm-hmm. didn't read well. Um, and I'm your friend, and I thought it didn't read well. And I think I messaged you to be like, bro, this this wasn't great. Um, and and I think initially you were like a little bit oblivious to it. You're like, it is what it is. It's out there. Like, see what happens. But it just kind of escalated. And I remember day one was pretty bad. Then you started kind of semi trending on Twitter a little bit. Um, and then it was interesting because the next morning I, I was checking socials and I'm like, okay, this guy's still like doing Viral. bits the, the numbers are like yeah, yeah. i think that how on they twitter were. that video went up to like 4 million 14 million 14 yeah 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 no it went viral viral man <laughs> so yeah there was a bottle in one of the clips and <laughs> you were like turning it sideways um it was it was a profound piece of of uh speaking so thank you for that but according to what you said about earlier about me speaking <laughs> <laughs> well, this wasn't your best work let's put it that way but anyway so so um 14 million is not a nice number to see when everyone no. is basically mocking you and, and yeah. laughing and making fun of you um that M- munya uh can't remember his last name the comedian i don't think anyone knows how to pronounce his name uh, munya Chihuahua or something? Uh, i'm not sure um but yeah. he he also the made a video reason. so that was after yeah. it had kind of died yeah, down yeah. and then that video came out but what i wanted to say is i remember 
the morning after it had first gone viral and I was I was thinking like, oh, this guy must be really going through it. It was like 6.37 a.m. And I was like, I really want to call him to see if he's okay, but I, 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 I don't know what's going through his head. And I promise you, like two minutes later, you messaged me and you were like, yo, are you up? Are you free for a chat? Mm. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So then we had a whole kind of conversation. We, we, we kind of just talked through it a bit of, uh, damage limitation yeah. or whatever. Salim is my PR. Um, <laughs> unofficial. Unofficial PR. <laughs> PR uh, <laughs> crisis manager. <laughs> um, so I guess firstly, uh, what was, I think, yeah, we can talk about ego, but I, I, firstly, let's get into it because mm. not many people experience 14 million people in the world looking at something and passing a sweeping judgment of them as an individual. Yeah. What was that 48 hours like for you? I think it's important to understand what happened in that 48 hours to recognize that the past three or four years before that moment, the internet was nothing but nice to me, truly. Like I had received nothing but positive feedback, like, oh, great videos, thank you for inspiring me. Da, 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 da. So it was, it was, I had never seen the dark side of the internet the way that I did over those 48 hours plus. Um, and like genuinely, like as as like we discussed, like the reason why I'm online is because I want to put positive stuff out there. Like I genuinely try and just do, just say, say and do things that are positive. The moment that video started to gain traction, instantly you had s millions of people who uh, did not care at all about anything that you had done for the past four years, and they were taking you for thirty seconds, and that was all they were going to give you. And they were going to make a judgment out of you, whether you like it or not. There was a huge, huge sort of uh, weight of feeling misunderstood. Because I, I know that even I was informed about the context of what I said. Right. There were there were things that I said potentially that were taken out. Of, well, 100 percent were taken out of context. Um, but then it wasn't just about taking out of context. It was the judgment of not knowing who I was that compounded on that and people just thought I was the worst type of human being to ever walk on this earth and they were being very vocal about it, yeah. right? So I, I never realized how how hard I how hard it was to feel misunderstood. Um because I felt really misunderstood. When you say how hard it was, you mean like how difficult how it was how difficult yeah. that feeling is to cope with. Um, especially because I had just received nothing but positivity up until that point. Mm. But like I really, really felt heavy. Like I would wake up feeling like heavy, like genuinely heavy. Yeah. Uh, Can I ask a very like r random specific question? Go on. Like how often compared to normal are you looking at your phone in that period? Is it more or less? It was more until I had to stop myself. Mm. Um I made an active effort to not scroll through like all the comments. I don't think you could have got through them all, to be honest. No, there but was the lot. best ones got sent to me. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I sent you quite a yeah, few as well, I, I saw fair. one the other day, actually, a <laughs> screenshot <laughs> that you had sent. No, no, there were some hilarious, like, I'll be honest, Yeah, I was in on the joke as well, half the time. As much as it felt like crap, there were some creative, like, creative, like, jokes that were being made, and I was like, mate, 10 out of 10 for that one, because that was great. But right. at, at your expense, like that, I, I think now we can you can look back and maybe laugh a bit more, and yeah. it's it, it's it's not as thingy. But I remember it was a it was a very kind of tense time because yeah, you've yeah, yeah. you've spent years investing in a personal brand yeah. and an online brand yeah. where you're all about positivity, uplifting, yeah. whatever, and then for suddenly people to come along and and just kind of try and rip that down in one second. Yeah. And 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 to be honest, I guess kind of by your own doing mm -hmm. because it's not like there was a rumor that was spread or yeah, yeah, yeah. you attended something it's like no these are your words yeah, and yeah, yeah they were taken out of context but they're still your I've never seen the original clip funny yeah, enough yeah. The, the full length I've only ever seen those and I've only acted Mo as your unofficial PR yeah. agent like based, based on, on what other people have seen and what yeah you've seen. How, how you how you react to that because yeah, it, yeah, the yeah, truth yeah. doesn't matter in these times exactly and that's what hurt is that nobody cares actually about what the truth was mm. or what you were trying to say. Nobody cares about what you're trying to say. Yeah. They've judged you for what you've what they think you've said and that's all that matters to them. And they're gonna and now they're gonna paint the walls with that. Um but there was also a part of me that thought, okay, well, none of those people don't know me. Like there was there was a lot of there was the thing that I used to talk myself back to like reason with was like, these people don't know me. These people don't know 
my intentions. These people don't know how I wake up, how I what. like genuinely made me feel like cared for and like loved in that moment and I've, I've never forget those people um because like they were on the phone with me for hours like trying to talk it through understand what's going on da, da, da. Um, but there was other people that like you once knew who just came about just to throw you a screenshot like a grenade onto your whatsapp and then just dip and I'll know, I'll, you know, those people, I'll forgive and forget and hopefully try and forgive and forget. But, like, you see people's true colours in a moment yeah. of crisis like that. Um, but also you see your own colours in a moment of crisis like that. Because... What, what, what day, did you discover about yourself in that time? A day before I this thing went viral, I actually got a email that had invited me to give a talk at Buckingham Palace. 24 hours before? 24 hours, maybe 72 hours. Like, yeah. literally within yeah between 48 sorry 48 and 24 hours like very fresh fresh news i've just been invited to give a speech so i was invited to buckingham palace to give a talk um and after that this clip went viral even the pe like I, I when i got invited to buckingham palace i still remember i was i sat down with my dad on like on a break on the breakfast table and i was like dad like, isn't it crazy like, like i just got invited to go speak at buckingham palace like this is mad like i'm 26 years old and I'm, I'm being invited to speak at Buckingham Palace and like I had all these sort of ideas and emotions running through my head but looking back those moments were very very ego full mm. like I was kind of thinking damn look I made it you know I got invited to speak at Buckingham Palace fast forward 12 hours I get a call while I was at work and I remember I got to pick, pick up this call and it's like hey you know, just calling um, because we've caught sight of this clip, and yeah, we're we're withdrawing your invite to speak at Buckingham Palace. We don't want you to speak at the palace anymore. We believe our views don't align with yours, and uh, we cannot kind of have you representing us. Well, was there no ask of like, can you clarify? It was just this it is was, it. And these are people who knew me. Mm. I'd spoken before at other events. These are people who I'd known for years, but. The rug got swept on from under my feet and that was probably what hurt even more because it's okay for like random people to not like yeah. you but when somebody who you thought you knew and they knew you pull out like an opportunity of that magnitude right it hurt because it's like well you just give me a chance to clarify like i and i got very defensive on the call I got very defensive in hindsight it was the wrong thing to do because like it is what it is you know god's got a plan um but uh, upon reflection of that moment i realized why god took that opportunity away from me and it was because of those moments of ego poking its head above sort of the line um when i was when i was thinking damn like fucking a palace like i made it mm. it was those moments where i forgot that god gave me all these things god is the one who put all these opportunities in front of me i didn't do it myself I didn't work hard and hustle and get it. Like there's a clip from Khabib who's like, oh, you think work, ho you know, working hard is what got you here? What about all those people who break their back 24 seven trying to just put food on the table? Why aren't they the successful ones? Why aren't they on the news? Why aren't they winning the gold medals? They, these people work just as hard. You think God is the one who gave you everything that you have. It's not about how hard you work. God is what provides. And those moments started really resonating after that moment. And it gave me a different perspective of my ego. Like uh, the one that doesn't say Alhamdulillah after everything that happens that's not a place that's no man's land that's where a place i never want to be and it's a place that i got to in that moment and i feel like god created this whole backlash genuinely i look back and i think god made this thing happen to teach me a lesson that whatever he provides all the good that people believe of me all the people like the good intention that people see of me inshallah is his doing and i i'm just a tiny little sort of pawn in all of this um, it's I'm not it's not just me going yeah I've made this personal brand and stuff nah but then in a moment it can all get swept away out of a misunderstanding um, so stay humble that's <laughs> that's crazy that within the same week you get you know uh, for you what was a, a one of the biggest opportunities 
to speak in front of people that you had yeah. and like a recognition of your um your career i guess yeah uh alongside the sort of darkest period oh, yeah. um that you Especially experienced felt like yeah, i felt like if you had the day i woke up knowing i was like in a, in a couple of months time going to speak in buckingham palace the next morning waking up mm. i felt like i, I might just, just I, w- I wish the world could just swallow me and i started to but deal with it so i'm just trying to think had you not needed to so you perceive it that you needed to learn a lesson yeah and you learned that lesson yeah so had you not needed to learn that lesson would your do you think your state of mind would have been a lot more calm in both instances do you know what i'm saying say that again so like you get the call from buckingham palace yeah right um if you're aware that this is god doing this yeah. not you yeah. then it's not uh, the ego massage that it is and you're not like oh check me out it can still be exciting to to be going mm. there and and doing whatever um but do you think it's heightened by the ego and then also when this stuff happens and and everyone's going crazy online uh, again we can argue it wasn't necessarily your doing it was just a a, a situation but if you didn't feel like it was a personal attack on yourself and you mm. felt like this was part of God's plan and yeah. God has put this all together yeah. you wouldn't feel as deflated yeah. because so that arguably it's God in both situations so on both ends of the scale the ego it neutralizes amplifies it. It. yeah, yeah. It, the ego either amplify or neutralize it's basically like the ego is a multiplication factor of how good or bad you'll feel exactly yeah so so do you, do you think that's uh changed in yeah. you or do you still feel oh. sometimes damn that's crazy you know i just remembered my dad always tells me a hadith where I think it's it's uh, Imam Ali that says when you're happy don't get too happy and when you're sad don't get too sad. Mm. It's basically that. Cuz if you think about the ego as a multipli- a multiplier multiplier factor, yeah. The higher your ego, the either happier you'll get or the sadder you'll get. But when you minimize ego, the hadith of Imam Ali just comes to life. Mm. That's mad. Yeah, I think I think so. I think so like when you when you like and, and the conversations i was having when i was feeling at my lowest it was that reduction of ego to say listen don't worry god's got a plan like and actually having that tawakkul to say god i don't know why this is happening but i'm going to leave that up to you to understand but it almost it's interesting because it almost feels like it's a lot easier in the lows to mm. turn to god yeah and then in the highs yes because in the highs you can attribute all to yourself and be like, yes. yeah i did this yes, 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 and no yes. one's and then it's only when it goes south. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah, sorry, God. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you for for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's it's, I I think for me at least, um, when things like this happen in life, I I feel like it's often a case of, you have to take the lessons away. Yeah. Not no one no one uh, can present it. You can just look at it like, oh well, that was a that was a crappy week. Yeah. Um, that was a random week, you know. That, yeah. But you you it's when you reflect, um. And and again, like we've had so many conversations about things that have happened in both of our lives, mm. where it's like when you take stock, you realize, and like sometimes it'll be like I said this to you two years ago, and now here we are today. Yeah. Um. And and you might even remind me of that, like, oh yeah, do you remember when you said this? And I've completely forgotten. And it's yeah. like you you this is what you wanted, this is what you're working towards. Yeah. And now it's here. Yeah. Then you're able to kind of see it all for for this kind of master plan that God is kind of putting together. And it's the ups and the downs that get you to where they are. This is again like if you rewind the conversation I told you like I I, I try to avoid putting a time like limit on like when I want to be s- certain places mm. like, I want to enjoy the journey because actually you realize that there's beauty in the ups and the downs like the downs have beauty in them and it was the moments where like when I was having those conversations when I felt my lowest my f- my friends who would remind me that this is God's plan like do not question why you're here just remember that this is God's plan and actually seek refuge in God in these moments and it reminds that's that that helps the the, the ego trajectory just go you know down a spiral and then yeah zoom out and see the big master plan we'll never see we'll never know mm. we'll ne- like you will only when you're on your deathbed you'll know what at least maybe your life trajectory yeah, was. Yeah, you'd only know this much, right? But even if you were to take your life out of the equation mm. and look at every other puzzle piece around you and how your life fit into their life, 
that's when you'll actually know. But only God knows that because you don't know the guy who was driving past you today as you were coming here may have, I don't know, may have seen your, if your car wasn't there, he would have seen something and made a different decision because your car was blocking the path. It's a little thing. Fine margins. You just yeah. never know. You just yeah. never know. So having that tawakkul to say, yeah. Uh, so we've, we've gone a bit deep and spiritual here. Um, it's been no. It, I, I've, it's, been I, nice. it's it's been interesting. Um, I was gonna ask, but I guess because we're talking about ego, it doesn't really make sense. But I was gonna ask how you want to be remembered. Um, but I think a more apt question, given the last sort of five ten minutes of conversation, is more: what legacy do you want to leave behind? Yeah. And I guess I'll ask you the question: How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered? This idea of like your puzzle piece being a part of somebody else's journey um, and actually being something that affects other people. I like the idea of the impact that your life has is only really seen after you're gone. I like the idea, like how can you live a life that the impact of which outlives you, right? How can you do as much as you can in this life and maybe you rock the boat as much as you can in this life so that the waves and the ripples that you create mm -hmm. Even when your sip is, is sunk, are still creating some sort of waves in the ocean, and I feel like um, the what really helped me understand that moment was was probably learning more about my grandfather's story. So I grew up very far away from my grandfather um, here in the UK. He was living in Iraq, and I always heard of him. Is like we'd go to our granddad's house in Iraq when we were on holidays, um, and we'd see you know he gets picked up. At around 11 o'clock and he'd come back at like 3 and he'd be like yeah, oh yeah Jeddu's gone to do salah and come back but what we didn't see is like you, you just you see granddad right you don't see him I knew he was a leader of his community and stuff like that but I never saw him as that I just saw him as granddad um, he had a, a very difficult sort of sort of last five years of his life um, where he was he was tested a lot by Allah I think and especially the this idea of when you give, 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 give all your life, you spend serving. He was a teacher, then he became a alim, then he became the leader of a community, and his whole life was just dedicated to service, to serving the community. The last five years of his life, the people who he served weren't there to serve him when he needed them the most. And when I was with him in Syria on his last days and I asked him, you know, Jiddu, how are you? Like, how are you? He'd say, I am with God. We are like I am with God. You wouldn't. You'd think, oh, you know, he'd he'd want other people to like give back to him in this moment, but never. No one was there to give back to him when he passed. And this is the moment where everything that that flick switched in my mind when he passed. I remember I was in his house in Baghdad, and you know all the family is grieving, and I'm in the room grieving, and I hear my sister scream like from the next room. She is calling me. She's like, Muhammad, come. And I remember when I ran to her, she was holding her phone and she was like, look, look, look. And when I look down at her hand, I see that pictures and like banners of my grandfather are being like uplifted in the streets of Baghdad. They say, goodbye, O father of the orphans, you are going to be missed. These are like the streets of Baghdad that are being lined with his pictures and his, and his, his memory. And I broke down in tears. I'm like, this is my granddad. The same guy who I used to just see, like, just walking around the house doing his wadu, praying. Like, pe like, people are calling him the father of the orphans. And when I went to this community, bro, I saw a whole community weep of the loss and the vacancy that this man is going to leave behind. Like, you can see how much his life had an impact on the lives of the people around him. Like, that's what he left behind. He left behind, behind this this uplift of the community where the community was in a better place because he existed because he lived his life Allah used him as a channel to make the world a better place and genuinely impact lives on an individual level so when I look at my life I think okay well the, what sort of memory what sort of what's going to happen the day that I die the day that I die is it just going to go silent and people are like yeah whatever just another just another body or actually are people going to say, you know what, the, what, he made the world a better place. Like he left this place better than what he found it. I want to just try and use my life as like a vessel to try and take whatever Allah has given me and like put it out into the world. 
just like a transfer, you know, like in one way, out the other. And if I can use that to make the world a better place and genuinely make this world a better place and like impact lives on an individual level, like the messages, the DMs that you get saying, bro, like oh, once I got him a DM by this guy, this young man who had watched another podcast that I'd done and he described to me how low he felt that past week. He was suicidal, like he was on the verge of, of ending his life. Um, and for some reason he came on YouTube and he opened up this video and he watched a, a podcast episode that I'd done. And he said, bro, you have no idea how much that one podcast episode changed my perspective on my life to the point where now I'm, I'm so inspired to want to make something out of it. Whereas before I was literally about to end my life and I, I wept, bro. I was in bed on a Sunday morning at 6 a.m. I was weeping, reading this long message thinking, how is it like, how, how can one human being have such an impact on another human being? And I just want to do spend like the rest of my life doing that. I want to just join impact and uplift people around me. And inshallah, leave this place a better place than I found it. That's it. I have uh, very little to say after that. There's, um, yeah, that's. I think especially the the story um, regarding your your grandfather um, is very interesting um, and. I think it, 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 as you say, it, it kind of shows uh, the the impact that we can have. Um, and, and as you said, it's like after he passed, you see what he meant to the people, what, what kind of legacy he left behind. Yeah. Um, and that's something where it's not about the, the, the individual, it's about the work. Yeah. It's about what he did. What's exactly. what's what's going to be missed in his absence is the work that he did. Precisely. Um, and that's that's just remarkable. And I, I guess like it, it almost kind of nods to you. It makes sense that that you are who you are and you're doing what you do. If that's the kind of family that you come from, that's the kind of lineage that you have, right? Yeah. Um, so no, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, it, man. We're, we're, we're kind of coming to the end. I don't want this to end, but um, we're, we're at the point of um, no return, I guess. <laughs> uh, I wanted to, so like I've, I've mentioned on the last few episodes, I'm, I'm trying to, so uh, like I've, I've got into reading. Yeah. And and I like to ask people for you started another podcast about reading. I as start, well. Yeah, we, we're not plugging other podcasts. Oh, this okay. this is this podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I I I, uh, I like to ask people for book recommendations mm. because firstly, I think it's very uh, interesting to see what people have read and what's kind of led them to these conclusions. Because what I've realized, the more I'm reading, is that th the books I'm reading are shaping how I view the world. Yeah. They're shaping how I see things, how yeah. I perceive interactions, whatever it might mm. be, depending on what the, or even how I engage with like political ideas, if it's a book about politics or whatever. And it's, it's, it's hugely important. So um, with the last few podcasts, we were talking specifically about Palestine. So the books were all kind of geared towards that. Yeah. Um, with yourself, I just said like anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any book recommendations, be it about mm -hmm. aviation or whatever, um, yeah. over to you. Three. Three? Three. Is that enough? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, we could. I can give you more if you want. No, no, no. no. It's <laughs> three, please. <laughs> okay, so the the only way I can answer this really is the ones that have had the most impact on my life. Yeah. Um, looking back. So the top of that list usually for me um, is the day that I understood how important other people are on my journey. Like how it's not just about how hard I work, but actually about how I click into society. That's what matters the most. And what really brought that to life and gave me the tools to help me understand other people who we interact with on a daily basis, the book that taught me that the most was How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Right behind, behind you there. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, so Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That was the book that made me realize that other human beings are relatively predictable. Um, and actually, if you want to make the most out of a situation where you interact with a person, there are some key things to keep in mind right remember their name say it with a smile stuff that you might read and think Ugh, that's so basic if applied correctly you can genuinely use to build such meaningful close connections with other people mm. and much like we said at the networking let's just have a chat this is like how to have a good chat 
skills 101 yeah and for me maybe now i think okay well this is basic but when i read it when i was like 21 it was revolutionary because nobody actually teaches you this stuff but you say how to have a chat i think deeper than that is how to connect with people yes how, yes. how to actually open that door to have a deep and meaningful yeah. conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. off the bat 100%. rather than how's the weather <laughs> you know okay exactly um i like exactly. that it's, so, a, it's a good book i've read that as well i, I, yeah. I do like that and book. plenty of case studies in there that bring you real life examples yeah. and teach you that so that's one how to win friends and influence people the next one is um again these were paradigm shifts that i had so one about people was the biggest paradigm shift the other one was about how broken the system is like the financial educational job system is in the world and the one book that really brought that to life initially for me was um this book here so rich dad poor dad i'll just hit it there so this one rich dad poor dad oh um basically you can work a nine to five job all your life get to 70 and still be struggling to get ends meet like the system is just developed that way and actually if you want to live a life where money isn't a, a, like a, a anchor um there's ways to go about that but you have to fundamentally shift the way that you the other the other book wants to be book. announced <laughs> no, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you, there's fundamental things that you can <laughs> just dropping books dropping knowledge um, <laughs> <laughs> um there's there's the fundamental like mindset shifts that that are again to some people might seem very simple yeah but for a young person who wants to like shape the way that they view of the world this book is pretty good at that uh teaches you an asset and a liability and all that sort of things so that's that one there and then the last one this is a very interesting book key person of influence because this book i did not purchase this book showed up to my doorstep with just the words moti my address and no notes you have no clue who gave it no to you. idea who sent this me this book that's creepy. This was about is that, four is years that not ago. creepy? It's too? very creepy. I have not. I've never given my address to anybody. But why but would like, you even? I would burn the book. I read it straight away. <laughs> I, like, is in okay. Anyway, I read it straight away, and I started to make notes. Oh, is that is that what was the in boarding there? Pass. <laughs> the boarding pass. Boarding pass. That's what I there. use as my as my <laughs> as my bookmarks. Um, but yeah, this book and what's interesting about this book is it's the five step method to becoming the most highly valued and highly paid people in your industry. Person or people? Yeah highly paid person in your industry. And this says, this book explains exactly how to get to the inner circle of any industry fast. When I reflect on that New York flight, mm. I was the only person on that flight who was invited, not because of their job, but just as an individual. And I was the only person from minority background who was in that category. And I was the youngest person on that flight who was invited just as an individual. One of two people invited just as an individual. And I think to myself, how did I end up there? Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that happen, of course. But then this book literally gives a five-step method on how to become that person in your industry. How to grow a brand that is so recognizable, that you get invited to join these circles. And this book just showed up on my doorstep one day. And I took notes. And literally, if you look, if you look through it, I literally have the word motivate written all over this. Like I had started my page by that point. And I was building my page. And I hear it seriously, look exercises make a list of the possible micro niches in your industry that you most enjoy motivating kids into engineering written there motivate public speaking influencing people engineering chains companies engineering companies like the stuff that i wrote in this book four years ago you've manifested like are happening now yeah. and it's amazing to see so yeah i'd recommend this book just because like when i look at my journey i'm i'm just it's a step-by-step -step method and i'm kind of just going through the steps so it's amazing. We'll, we'll, we'll put the links to um, all of these in the in the description. Thank yeah, you yeah. very much. I realized, by the way, I've, I've forgotten in the entirety of this conversation to shout out our sponsor. Yes. OK. Go um, on. It's a, a, a modest fashion wear brand called Covered in Confidence. Nice. I'm sure myself and yourself are really excited yeah. to. Well, we can't really you, engage. You are covered in confidence. I am. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't actually. Especially wear. with that trim. <laughs> <laughs> can't wear any of the products but um shout out to, to covered in confidence the link will be in the description we're nice. hoping to also have a discount code for our this is for the sisters yeah for the sister i mean brothers can but like maybe for your wives or True. sisters yeah, or yeah, mothers yeah. but 
Uh, it will be in the description um, with oh, a nice. discount code amount TBC. So I can't really give a figure. Yeah, but a uh, discount is available. A discount is available. TMV special. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you very much. I, you I'm, I'm glad we got to do this like maybe what f- four or five years later than you wanted. Hey, I'm I'm I'm, I'm riding the wave. <laughs> now, now you're just riding the wave, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, um, I appreciate you having me, man. Thank but no, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, inshallah, we will be back uh, in another couple of weeks with another guest talking about another topic. It's very. Very open. I don't, I don't even know. I, I don't know. But um, no, thank you guys very much. If if this is the first time you're watching uh, our podcast or listening, please do subscribe. Give us a nice rating. Leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube. We'd love to know what you think. And if you have any thoughts or suggestions for other guests, then leave them below. And inshallah, we'll try and get them on. Thank you. Take care and g- good night. I don't know. It was going. It was. So it was going so well. Yeah. Good night. <laughs>